This training is going to be on subcommunication and tonality in sales. Okay. So have you ever wondered why two different salespeople can use the same exact script, say the same exact words, but they get entirely different results? Okay. Well, all of those things being equal, what does it have to be? It's the things behind the words, right? Like a writer would say, it's in between the lines. So it's the things behind the words, and it's really that subcommunication and tonality and how that makes somebody feel and how that makes somebody receive your information through how they're communicating. So what's really cool about this training is obviously the context is selling and the context is in sales and persuasion and stuff like that, right? But everything that we're gonna uh, do in this training can be can apply to dating, let's say, for sure. Uh, it can apply to networking, speaking, a business negotiation, really anything in terms of how to present yourself properly. So very, very cool, such a uh, cool training, very, very in depth, as you'll see. So it might be something you want to go through this, then go through the regular sales training later in the series, like the actual words to say, right? And then come back to this for a review. But with that being said, what are we going to cover? Three mechanisms of social conditioning that dictate idea receptiveness. So that's one. Three certainty distinctions, three tells of dominance and dominance, you know, and think of this, not like you're dominating your prospect or anything, but it's more like leadership and certainty. Okay. Three levels of rapport in tonality. And then we're going to go through some examples at the very end. Okay. So let's get into it. Three mechanisms of social conditioning that dictate idea receptiveness. What the heck does that mean? Okay. Here's the deal. There's so much information in this world. There's too much information in this world for your mind, particularly your particular activating system to process at one time, right? Like there's so much coming in that what our brain has to do is it has to filter that information. Now in NLP, they talk about generalized, like we like to generalize things. We like to delete certain things and distort certain things, right? That's why if you take something and then play telephone all the way you go th throughout the circle, when you get back to where you started, it might be something entirely different, right? And that's because we generalize the lead to sort, okay? So that's an NLP. Now, in this example, and that's very valid too, by the way, but in this example, I wanna talk about three other filters. And this dictates how likely somebody is going to accept your ideas to be true, okay? So again, just to restate this, we have three primary mind filters that allow us to quickly and easily decide using the least amount of energy possible. Remember, biologically, we wanna conserve energy. That's how we survive. So three filters to quickly and easily decide which ideas to accept to be true. So what are those three filters? The certainty of the person communicating the idea, the inner alignment of the person communicating that idea, and then other people's thoughts and ideas around the idea, which AKA social proof, okay? So three filters, all right? Now the more, we're gonna unpack each of those, and the more you're, I, um, you're communicating with these three things sort of behind it as the foundation of your communication, the more likely someone is going to accept what you're saying to be true, which in a persuasion context, right? When you're trying to build a case or an argument uh, to sell your product or sell an idea, right? That's very, very important, right? You want to accept, you want them to accept your ideas to be true, right? That's what it's all about. So let's pack it. Uh, let's, uh, unpack each of these, going into first, the certainty of the person communicating the idea. So you probably heard before, it's not what you say, it's how you say it, okay? Well, here's, let's let kind of unpack that a little bit. So here's three good distinctions of how you can understand certainty when it comes to tonality. The first one's called sound of belief. I don't know who I heard this from, but it's always stuck with me, the sound of belief, okay? And the easiest way I could explain this is if you look at, let's say, you know, right now we have an extreme political climate, you know, and things are very, very controversial uh, and antagonistic on both sides, right? And you, and if you look at each side, whether that's a politician or somebody in the media, you know, there's like a lot of yelling, a lot of screaming. There's like this attitude that if you don't get it, there's like something wrong with you or you just don't get it. Like there's something just wrong with you for not, you know, accepting what, in their perspective is a painfully obvious idea. And so that communication that you see on both sides, I do not think that's positive communication, I'm not endorsing it, but that is the sound of belief, right? It's almost like this thing to where when you believe in what you believe so much to where 
when like, let's say the prospect or whoever you're in a negotiation with, when they don't get it, you're like, it's almost like you have this mental, like, what's like wrong with you? Like, how do you not get this? Like, it's so obvious. Okay. And so what I'm not, I just want to be super disclaimer here. I'm totally not advocating you putting down uh, your prospects or anybody in a negotiation or anything like that. You're not putting them down, not making them feel stupid or dumb or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is you need to have a belief that's so strong that almost like that urge comes up in you, right? To where you're like, man, like this product, like it's worked so well for us. We have thousands of case studies. You already told me that you have this problem. You don't know how to fix it. If you don't fix it, this is going to happen. You know, this is going to work. But then when, you know, price is on the table, now we're getting squirmy. Like what's really going on? Like, how do you not see this? Like, how do you not get this? Obviously, this is going to work for you. It's like that kind of energy is what we want to cultivate. And it just comes from having this ironclad certainty. Every bone in your body just knows that this is the right thing. Now is the right time. And um, you're, you know, one of my old mentors, Eli Wild, used to say, your certainty needs to overcome their doubt, right? And that's a lot of the sound of belief. And this is why sound of belief, again, is why if you take two salespeople, one's a little bit more, let, let's say they're relatively equal skill, but one of them is tactically a better salesperson, right? But then the other one has way more conviction. Which one's going to sell better? The one with the conviction. Why? Because of the sound of belief. People are just going to be like, man, that guy just, he's honest. You could tell he just believes in it. And he's passionate about it. And that's what it's all about. So that's one distinction here of, of certainty of the person communicating the idea. The next one is this distinction. I think this will help you pumped up certainty versus resolve. Okay. So what's the difference between pumped up certainty and resolve? Pumped up certainty is like going to Tony Robbins UPW and it's like, yes, 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 yes. Like you're absolutely certain you're like this hypey high energy salesperson. And look, I have nothing wrong with being high energy. But like, you know, you're this hypey, high energy salesperson or something like that right now. If you are, let's say a $10 million, if you're in my shoes, I'll just tell you this. And I'm going in to buy a software for my company. Okay. You know, I'm uh, looking at a new CRM. I don't really like, if you're this hypey, you know, you know, pumped up salesperson who just did a bunch of, you know, jumping on the trampoline and like, you're like, yes, yes, you know, Tony Robbins style. Like, does that make me want to buy your software? Like, no, you know, now I definitely, it is better than being like an Eeyore and being low energy, right? So yes, it is better than that. But there's another level to it, right? There's a way to be certain that's not, and it actually more certain, that's not this pumped up certainty. That's called resolve, all right? And so... One thing I want to uh, I want to uh, outline about the pumped up certainty. There's a lot of sales trainers out there even now who that's really kind of what they teach still, and you know some of their clients have really good success. Why is that? Well, if you are a low energy per like if you are just like not a high energy person, you know you, you have no standards, you don't work out, you're not pumped up, you have no certainty whatsoever. Going from like the Eeyore to the pumped up certainty, like yeah, you're gonna get better results, no doubt. It's kind of like um, if you read Levels of Energy, you know, you have to, the first step of breaking out a lot of times of shame, fear, um, guilt, and some of these really low vibration emotions is anger. Right now, is anger the right way to lead your life? No, but it's kind of like you have to go through that phase sometimes to get to the next one. That's kind of what pumped up certainty is like in respect to resolve. So what's resolve? Resolve is the certainty as if it's almost already done, okay? I'll give you an example is before I had, you know, a goal for a long, long time of mine was to have a million dollars in my bank account, right? Like that was a goal. And, you know, like in the beginning phases, I'd be like, okay, a million dollars in my bank account. Like I'm going to journal about it in the morning. I'm going to like visualize it in my mind. And I got to just like really like feel it and like, yeah, you know, and that's kind of like pumped up certainty. And then what's funny is, when I was most certain about it was probably like three, four, five months away from when I hit it. But I could tell based on my income that I had coming in that I was going to hit it no problem. So I had resolve. It was at that time, even though it, 
I didn't have that million dollars in my bank account. It was as if it was already done. You know, like I knew without question, unless there's some crazy black swan, without question, I'm going to hit that. Right. And that was years ago. But like, as you, it's almost like, you know, in sports, like as you sort of start getting and you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, you, you, you get out of this pumped up certainty and you start to get into resolved where it's like, no, it's like already done. Like you just know. Okay. And to give you a sports example, sometimes like if you're playing a really, really hard opponent, you might have to really like pump yourself up, but there's some nerves, there's some tension. If you're playing somebody to where you've known you've done all the preparation needed and you know you're better than them and you know you're going to win, you almost go into it with resolve. You go, what's the difference? Instead of that tense, pumped up certainty, you go in loose, you're having more fun and you're in this place where um, you're just in complete flow state, right? And, And the easiest way I can think about that in a sports example is think about like, the Patriots during the Belichick Brady era, right? Like they're not like crazy pumped up, dramatic on TV, causing a bunch of drama. It's like, put their head down, get the work done, but they're so confident, right? So resolve is a good, uh, a good distinction for this as well. The next distinction in terms of certainty is what I call shallow versus depth of expression. So when somebody talks, there's a certain weight to it. Okay, there's like a certain weight that you can sense sense uh, sense from it. And you can tell is what they're saying, does it come from thousands of hours of experience being in the trenches, truly being the best of the best topic at hand, or is what they're saying like shallow? You know, do they lack that experience? Can you sense that there's not a lot of depth behind it? Okay. So there should feel like there's this like heaviness around the communication. Okay, what's the classic example? Social media, right? There's everybody making videos on how to make passive income and how to do this and how to do that and how to do this, right? Well, if Elon Musk makes a video about being a successful entrepreneur in 2023, and then some guy who's, you know, making 10K a month from YouTube AdSense makes a video about how to be a successful entrepreneur in 2023, like which has more weight behind it, okay? Even if theoretically they said the same exact words, which has more weight behind it? Obviously, Elon Musk, right? It's a big reason why Alex Ramosi and a lot of his content says when you're making content, like you should really just report what you've actually already done. And that's because people can really sense, like, is there weight behind the words you're saying? It's the same exact reason why, like, somebody like Tom Bailu or Ed Milet, you know, the Patrick McDavid. These guys all sold their companies for multiple nine figures or, you know, in Tom Bailu's case, a billion dollars, right? And they have podcasts. A lot of other people are trying to build podcasts too. Well, why are these guys so popular in like the personal development space? Because there's weight and meaning behind the words they're saying. Even if their audience doesn't even know what their background is, they can sense that. It's very, very important, okay? So um, what are the action items that you want to take away from this, okay? Well, if you're an entrepreneur... You probably already likely have, unless you have some sort of imposter syndrome, right? Like you already likely have this because hopefully what you're selling is a problem that you know that you've already solved, that you, you know, this problem's like your bitch, right? Like you know exactly how to solve it. It is no problem. Like you are the master in the world of solving this damn problem. And whatever you're selling, you've probably done yourself or fixed that problem for yourself first. Or maybe you have a ton of testimonials and results that can back that up, right? Like there has to be that weight behind it. But for entrepreneurs, a lot of times it comes very easily, right? So if you're a salesperson, how do you do it? Well, it's actually really the same thing. Number one, you have to really know your industry. Like when I was selling for traffic and funnels, we we helped coaches and consultants and and, and so on, you know, scale the lead generation. And, you know, I knew that industry so well. And then on top of that, most of our clients were trying to go from zero to hundred grand a month. So I knew my industry really well. And then the other thing you want to know as a salesperson is you want to be a master at the problem, right? You want to be the world's most foremost expert in the problem your company solves. That problem's got to be your bitch, right? And I also had that, right? I knew the industry really well. And when it came to getting coaches from like zero to hundred grand a month, man, like I knew how to tell them to get there, like the absolute back of my hand. Okay. And I just, it's like, I had so much certainty behind it because I had thousands of conversations where I was talking about the problem. I had learned from some of my, you know, my mentors and 
the people I was selling for of how to fix the problem. I knew the industry really well. I had all of these case studies and, I, and patterns that I had seen of the clients that we had to back it up. I had done so much, you know, I assumed so much information. I had totally get it. So it's like I would get on the calls with, you know, business owners who were more successful than I was, but I could just talk circles around them when it came to fixing this problem, right? When it came to this problem, I was much higher status, right? Like we talked about in the previous video, it's a difference between, you know, a surgeon might have really good general status in the, in the United States, just kind of out and about. But if he goes to a golf course and golfs with a golf pro in that context, the golf pro has the higher status, right? It's the same thing. When the conversation is about this certain problem, you want to be that expert in the problem so that you have the higher status, right? So you have some authority and it's not hard to do that because number one, all your, you know, you're going to have thousands of conversations about fixing this one problem, right? So you only have to master this one thing. That's all you got to focus on. And on top of that, the prospect wouldn't be on the call with you if they didn't have that problem. So it's really stat like as a salesperson, it sounds like, man, like how do I become the authority? And like, how do I, you know, command the same authority that the entrepreneur and the founder is commanding? It's really not that hard and it's achievable through doing these things within like a two, three month time frame. Like you can do it very, very quickly, even if you're a complete beginner. Okay. So we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Um, cause a lot of this stuff ties in with each other, but that's the, uh, first thing in terms of the certainty of the person communicating the idea. It's one of the three things that increases idea receptiveness. What's the second one? It's the inner alignment of the person communicating the idea. Okay. So what does this mean? Are you walking the walk? Or are you talking the talk? Right? Like again, a large part of why entrepreneurs can sell better than salespeople, why the founder can sell better than even their VP of sales that they hire in the very beginning, right? A big part about that is because they have way more alignment with the ideas that they're, that they're presenting, right? Um, it might be because they first solved that problem themselves. Um, it might be because, you know, um, they have tons and tons of case studies. They also know how much went into the product, right? But they're walking the walk, right? Like they've actually done that. So there's that inner alignment there. So um, you have to not just be talking about it, but you have to be living it and it has to be ingrained in your being. And that will make you so, so much more influential. Like a great example is there's tons of different sales recruiters and hey, we'll help you build your sales team people out there. And, um, you know, most of them I have never seen stick around for more than like three to six months. And the reason why is like they look at my success and then they just get into that industry, this industry, thinking like, oh, it's just a, it's such a good way to make money. Like Cole has a good offer. And I'm not saying I don't have a bad, uh, don't have a good offer. But what I think they're missing is like, no, I'm like really good at solving the problem. And like, we're, we we're the only ones who've actually done what we're trying to help clients do. Like we're helping people build their sales team, but we have a sales team that's going to produce 45, 50 million this year in cash. So, uh, you know, again, like most people who are reaching out to us for sales team help have nowhere near that success. So we're actually like, if I give you information about how to run a sales team, it's coming from really doing this at the highest level in this industry. Like in our perspective, like bubble of an industry, you know, we're up there as one of the best, right? Especially with the phone sales. So again, that's the inner alignment of the person communicating the idea, right? We're walking the walk. We're not just talking to talk. So um, another big aspect of this is up-leveling your, um, your growth as a person, your standards as a person, and your identity. Because nothing is more influential than who you are and the way you think, okay? Now, that sounds a little esoteric. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? One of my mentors used to say that sales is really just a transference of thinking, right? You're not selling them on the product. You're selling them on a way of thinking that leads to the product, right? So you might have seen my videos before. If you're Russell Brunson, he doesn't try to sell you on ClickFunnels. He sells you that funnels is the best, newest, fastest, best way to get customers online. And if you believe that to be true, then like, you know, you're probably going to buy ClickFunnels, right? That's like the next logical step is a byproduct of that belief. And so always in sales, you're selling them on a way of thinking. And if you can be somebody who is doing what they say they're going to do, has very, very high standards, has, has done a lot of personal development and work on themselves, knows how to make empowering decisions, knows how to think about making decisions. You're going to be able to help business owners or whoever your prospects are make more empowering decisions for themselves and transfer them that successful way of thinking 
that you had to work really hard to obtain. Okay. That's what I mean by inner alignment. So a few more tips on improving this. Uh, one is something you've probably heard before. This is like old school sales, but the mirror. Okay. So you want to be the prospect that you want to attract. So are you the prospect you want to attract? Do you make quick decisions? Do you invest in yourself? Or do you make a bunch of BS excuses? Um, cause your objections will be their objections. If you're selling a coaching program, that's $10,000 and you've never bought a coaching program. That's $10,000 or more. You're going to have a tough time selling it almost always. Okay. Um, if you know, you're over, like if you, uh, are overweight and you've tried to lose weight a bunch of times and it's never worked. And then you're selling a weight loss program to people just like you, but you've never even gotten the result. You've never even invested in yourself to actually, like you're too scared to invest in yourself to get that result and then follow through and take action, like you're not gonna do well, okay? If you always say you wanna think about it, when people tell you they wanna think about it, you're probably gonna, you know, you're probably gonna uh, take what they say at face value and let them think about it, okay? You're gonna have a hard time overcoming that objection because it's not even authentic, all right? So that's the first one, the mirror. Standards is the second one. So I kind of mentioned this before, but are you keeping the promises and commitments to yourself? So. One of our core values in Closures.io is what's called a high say-do ratio. Okay, so when we say we're going to do something, we actually do it, right? We want the say-do ratio to be one-to-one. -one. So if you say you're going to wake up tomorrow at 5 a.m., you wake up tomorrow at 5 a.m. If you say you're going to work out tomorrow, you're going to work out tomorrow at, you know, 5.30. If you're going to read 20 minutes a day, you read 20 minutes a day. If you're going to do, you know, if we're going to achieve these activities, we're going to do those activities. If you're going to hit this amount of sales a week, you hit that amount of sales a week, right? So we want to have that say high do ratio. And when you start doing what you say every time and that actions align with words constantly, and you can live up to that standard for yourself, it's so much easier to hold prospects accountable to the same standard. Because not only is your energy going to be higher, you're going to be much more confident, but at the same time, you can't influence your prospect to live up to their highest standards if you're not even living up to their own. If the prospect needs to align their actions with their words and do something out of faith, but not out of fear, but then your actions aren't aligning with your words, it's going to be tough for you to hold them accountable, right? And people can sense this type of stuff. The next one is improving your worldview. So uh, some of the best sales training could actually be personal development. Uh, saying I always like to have is your inputs dictate your outputs. What I mean by that is, you know, you can only put out into the world based on the information that you take in. And not just information in the form of like YouTube videos or books or, uh, you know, courses or anything like that. That's part of it. But it also can be mentors you've had, experiences you've had, learning lessons and failures and wins. You know, all of the information that we've taken and lessons that we've taken through our lives, it really dictates what we put back out into the world. And a great example of this is if you look at all the, uh, you know, philosophers, right? Um, I believe it was, it's like, Newton came from Galileo and then Einstein was heavily inspired by Newton and then several other people were heavily inspired by Einstein. And it's almost like this family tree of, you know, this set of people built upon these people's work, who built upon these people's work, who built, and it's almost just kind of like a pyramid family tree. And you see that with philosophy. You also see that with uh, another one is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It's like now in the United States and really all over the world, there's tons of different black belts and tons of different places you can train and schools, right? But those black belts were given their black belt by other black belts who, and you almost just go right up the tree to where you end up with, I think it is like a few people in Brazil at the very, very top of the pyramid who all these lower layers were people who built upon, you know, the Gracie's work, for instance. Okay. And so that's a great example of, you know, your inputs dictate your outputs. And those people who had great mentorship were able to kind of take what they had and then they take it one step further, pass it on to somebody else. That person takes it one step further. And that's a, you know, a great example of inputs uh, and outputs, right? So to digress, what I'm really trying to say here is what do we want to do? We want to curate as many good inputs as possible to do as much personal development as we can, work on ourselves, improve our worldview. And in doing that, you will just naturally become a better salesperson, okay? I can tell you right now, I'm pretty rusty in sales. Like I haven't been doing a ton of sales calls uh, because I'm, you know, running our company mainly. But at the same time, I would still slaughter myself from when I was in my prime simply just because my worldview now and who I've become and my standards and all of these things I've already talked about, they are my certainty. They're just light, you know, night and day better 
than three, four, five years ago when I was selling full time, right? Again, that's because of who I've become. So a few books I really recommend that are like personal development books that a lot of times just help you become really good at sales. And um, they can teach you how to think about making successful decisions. And you can share that with your prospects. Is 177 Metal Toughness Secrets of the World Class, Straight Line Leadership, Leaderships, Relentless by Tim Grover. Those are some good ones to get started. So um, let's move on to number three, which is social proof, okay? Other people's thoughts and ideas around the idea, okay? So this one is something that is probably not a novel concept to you. You probably know, okay, social proof is influential. In Robert Cialdini's book, Influence, it's one of the core tenets of what really creates influence on people in their decision-making. So it's very, very critical. Um, how do we do this in sales calls? I did link a training here that shows one of the biggest ways I do it, but it's through what I call uh, status drops. Now that kind of sounds douchey to be quite frank, but um, there's a way to do it that's cool, okay? So if you've ever been on a sales call, when I first started in sales, my sales trainer taught me to deliver these case studies to the client in almost the most like, it was like the most corny, a uh, weird fabricated way to, where the prospects like, okay, yeah, you're just telling me this long case study, like, you know, good job. Like it's almost like a presentation, right? We want to avoid that. We want to mention our case studies in the most casual um, native way in the conversation possible, right? To where it doesn't seem like it's forced. Like we're just uh, forcing these case studies or trying to use these case studies to persuade them. It should more feel like it's just naturally coming up in the conversation. So again, this training covers most of it, but the main two things is that what I always do is if the prospect's giving me their pain, right? If they're, start, if they're telling me about a certain challenge, let's say they're having with lead generation, and let's say they're a dating coach. Well, if I've had a dating coach who reached out to me and had a problem with lead generation and was able to take our program, let's say, and fix that problem, and now they're getting this result, I won't share the result yet, but as they're explaining the problem, I'll just say something along the lines of like, yep, that totally makes sense. And in fact, I know exactly what you mean. You know, we had a client before, uh, her name was blank and they also were struggling with lead generation because they were doing blank like you. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about them later, but I'm just telling you that or mentioning that because uh, I know exactly what you mean. So I'm just seeding, it's called seeding the case study and then using that to relate to their pain but I don't really go into what we did with that case study or the solution yet, because I'm going to create an open loop and go back to that later. So we're later in the call, maybe when I'm pitching, I can say, hey, remember earlier when I was talking about so-and-so, you know, dating coach, lead generation problem, right? So they had that problem just like you. This is the part of what we do that allowed them to benefit and ultimately benefit of that benefit, right? So that's the way I do it. I seed it early, come back to it later. If you want to know the full and full, it's in this document here. Uh, there's a link to this, obviously, in the description. You can you can get all this stuff. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing is when you're using case studies or proof points, and there's more proof points than just case studies. There's social proof, living proof. There's third-party endorsements. There's public key. Like, there's all sorts of different types of proof. But when you're using proof, okay, you always want to use it right after something that you want to prove to be true. Okay, it sounds obvious, right? So if we're talking about, let's say, that our, our, our program or what we're selling has four key aspects of it four key sort of like key results that we're going to get them. After each key result, I might want to give one or two case studies or one or two proof points. It doesn't always have to be case studies. It can be a reason why logic. It can be a personal story. Like it can be a lot of different things. But it's that proof point to drive what I just said home and to be accepted as true. Okay, so that's the other big thing that we want to do there. But that is social proof. Now, moving on. Vocal tonality and three tells of dominance. So for our purposes, think of dominance like certainty. All right. So there's three tells. All right. The first one is a full range of expression. All right. So what happens is, is, and this is what I've been told, you know, I'm not an evolutionary psychologist or anthropologist, but what I've been told is, you know, in prehistoric times, our bodies, and, and we just naturally learn to stifle our expression because if you're this loud, um, you know, intense um, open, you know, wild person, it could put you at risk of like the alpha male in the tribe, whoever's the leader throwing you out or exile or killing you or whatever. And that's like our ultimate fear, right? Is exile or death. And so I don't know if that's the actual reason we we've, we've learned to stifle our expression, but one thing is for sure 
is most of us go throughout life with a very stifled expression and body language for the most part, but even tonality. Okay. So we need to unstifle that. And if it's stifled, what's going to happen is like your range, right? Like think of a singer has like a long range. I mean, that's the same thing when you're actually just talking normally. Like there's a certain range that, that you have. And, you know, if you have, if you're stifled, you're going to have a really short range and it's going to sound like you're monotone. So it's going to sound like you're like this. And this is what it sounds like to have a limited range of expression. Okay. So that's an extreme example, right? But if you have a broad range Okay. There's times where you're really high pitch. There's times when you're saying things a little bit softly to bring people in. And there's times where you vary your cadence, which is another thing. Okay. So think of full range of expression as if it's like, it's almost the equivalent of an open body language. Okay. Which is something you also want to have. And, um, you know, there's tons of great body language tips on YouTube or, and, and stuff like that. You can look into it yourself, but range of expression is almost like the body language of the voice. Okay. The next thing is carefree and free flow expression versus contained expression. Okay. So this is something in which, um, the easiest way to explain this is with an example. Okay. So have you ever really cared what somebody thought of you and like you're around this person and when you're around them, you really care what they think about you. Okay. Now we never like to admit that we do. But we've all had that person. It might be a family member. I, you know, there was somebody I went out to dinner with. I mean, honestly, just a year ago. And this was a huge person in the space I really look up to. And man, I'll tell you what, like I was not myself around this person. Like I just was so in my head because I look up to this person so much that I get in my head and it contained my expression, right? Like you're almost afraid of like loosening up and like being yourself. And you start to second guess everything that you're saying and you start to really get in your head. Okay. So that's the difference between a contained expression versus free flow. So the solution to this is you have to be free of what others think about you and, um, really trust the spot, trust that you'll, uh, say the right thing spontaneously in the moment. So for instance, on a sales call, we do not want to be constantly thinking in our head. What do we say next? What do we say next? What do we say next? Looking at the script. What do we say next? Really what you want to do is you want to do an immense amount of training before the calls, right? And so really, really know your sales process in and out, like an immense amount of training. And then almost just rest your attention, almost like a meditation, but resting your attention on what the prospect is saying and just be entirely focused on them. And then trust spontaneously in the moment that the right words and the right things to say and the right strategies will come through you. Okay. Now that sounds woo 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 as hell. I get it. But I'm telling you, once you have the right training in place, that is what it's going to feel like. And any great salesperson will tell you, like, once you get really good and in a rhythm, it is almost like a meditation. You know, like you're totally in the moment, you're totally focused, you're in this flow state, and you just feel like you could influence anybody to do anything. And it just like everything just comes so naturally. And that's the state you want to be in, right? You have to trust that you'll do the right thing spontaneously in the moment. Now, a big part of that is you have to relinquish fear of rejection and what other people think about you, right? And you have to, uh, you know, trust that you're just going to do what's based in truth and what's right, okay? So that's number two. Number three is shifts in cadence, okay? So this is very simple, but... We want to have a wide range of expression. And then within that wide range, we want to vary our cadence. All right. So if you don't vary your cadence, it kind of sounds like this to where we're not varying our cadence and it sounds very boring. And it sounds like somebody who's like, you know, your history professor. Yeah. You know, it's like if, almost like a history professor. I remember I had one time that was just so incredibly boring, right? There was just no variance in cadence. Now, guess what? When you sound like you're reading a script, like you have, you probably heard people say, oh, you sound scripted, right? Or, oh, this sounds scripted. Well, when you sound scripted, that's when you lose that variation in your cadence. So to really drive this home, let me read to you what is not usually the most scripted part of the call, which is frame the call. Now there's a whole argument of if you should frame the call, if you should not frame the call, we'll cover that later. But for this example, 
let's just say you're doing it. And um, I'll show you how it sounds like with a limited range stifled expression and no variation in cadence. Hey, so what I really found to work best on these calls is first diving in to understand your business. So the mechanics of it, how it works, ultimately what you feel like are the constraints that are keeping you from moving, you know, see, you, you get the point there, right? Whereas if you have a natural and normal range of expression and cadence, it sounds like, hey, so what I really found to work best on these calls is first just really diving in to understand, you know, your business. So the mechanics of it, how it works. And ultimately what you feel like are the biggest constraints that are keeping you from moving forward. And then once we can figure that out, so you see like, that's just like a basic, um, and I'm still reading right from the script, right? But you can see the difference in range of expression versus cadence. Now I'm trying to be pretty extreme, uh, with my, with my example of like the monotone, right? But what I want you to do after watching this training is go back and review some of your sales calls and watch out for this stuff. Areas where you sound scripted, areas where you're not shifting your cadence, areas where you're you're uh, just constantly in the same pitch with your voice. And uh, again, this isn't something you should try. Like it doesn't take effort to do this. It's actually something in terms of varying cadence and in terms of full range of expression and free flow expression. These are things that happen naturally when we unstifle ourselves. Okay, when we're not in our head. And when we don't care what others think about us, when we're not afraid of a, a, a rejection and we can confidently express our truth in the moment, right? So it's actually something, it's not something you do. It's almost something you let go. All right. So again, cause if you try to do this, you're going to sound forced. You're going to sound even worse. So some of the examples we'll go over in a second help. Now, three levels of rapport. This is the last thing we'll cover. And then we're going to splice over to some examples. So three levels of rapport slash three different tonalities. So there's seeking rapport, neutral rapport, and breaking rapport. All right. So seeking rapport is an upward inflecting tonality, right? To where like you have that uncertain like question at the end of things that should be statements. Equal inflecting tonality is very basic. That's like when we're on the same side of the table. Okay. It's us together. That's 80%, 90% of conversation. And then there's downward inflecting tonality. Okay. Where we're breaking rapport. And that might be when you're challenging somebody on a sales call, when you're trying to kind of push them over the edge a little bit, or when you're really confidently expressing one of the key features about what you do or a result that your client got. I mean, it could be, it could be different things, but breaking rapport is something that is, uh, you know, you might use five to 10% of the time seeking rapport. You really shouldn't be using at all equal, uh, equal, uh, neutral rapport or equal inflecting tonality should be, you know, the majority of the conversation, right? And so again, what we really want to avoid is the seeking rapport, all right? And in sales calls, um, no, I, believe me, I have heard people sound, uh, I'll be on a call review with somebody. They sound super normal, super normal. And then I literally, li like I'm talking to them, they sound normal. Then I listen to their sales call and I have them on Zoom with me, entirely different person like upward inflecting tonality. They're not expressing that. It's like, you can tell they're in their head and when they're in their head, they're not even listening. So they're asking, they're saying they sound really scripted and it's like they're running people through a process. Again, like it's just, it, it's, it's something you let go. It's not something you do, right? Because the person sounds normal when they're on the call with me is when I put them in this new context, this, this fear of rejection and what people think about them and this nervousness, it, it, it shifts all of our cadence and we get stifled, right? And so, um, again, listen to your sales calls and watch out for this inflecting tonality. So upward inflecting tonality will sound something like this. Hey, so I really found the word best on these calls is first diving into understanding your business and the mechanics of it and how it works. And ultimately what you feel like is the constraints that are keeping you from being where you want to be. I mean, I can't even, it, it's so unnatural for me. It's so hard to say, but again, we want to avoid that at all costs. Like you will not get some, I mean, people will maybe buy to spite you. But if you got a lot of an upward inflecting tonality, you're really going to struggle. Okay. So what we're going to do here is we're going to splice over to a video, older training I did version of this training where I give some examples and then we'll end it from there. Thank you. You know, I made this training for one of our internal salespeople about a month ago and uh, it totally bumped him. Um, he wasn't necessarily out of pocket or in a rut, but it took him from like, you know, doing decent to just 
closing almost everybody he spoke with almost overnight, okay? And um, I just showed him the example of these two videos. And one is when I first started making paid marketing content, and this is just really embarrassing. And then the second one was like from a, you know, about a month ago when, uh, you know, I put out a lot of content. I just don't care what people think anymore. I'm just like, whatever, okay? So what's funny is like, this is, you know, both of these are, I was, I'm, I was great at sales when I recorded both of these. But what I wasn't as experienced in was creating video content on this first one. And I was a little bit more thoughtful and critical about what I was putting out. And you can see it in my vibe, like I'm kind of trying to play it safe, okay? So before we get into these, I want you to look at the difference in levels of dominance, the vibe, the difference in levels of vibe, there were one, I just know exactly what I'm talking about. It's like no bullshit, I've done this a thousand times. Um, I'm here to like lead you through this process, listen up. Um, the downward inflecting tonality and kind of the feeling like you're running downhill with how you speak in the second one. And then in the first one, the apprehensiveness and the vibe of like being safe, okay? And also look how my eyebrows lifted. That's also a sign of uncertainty, like you don't know what you're doing. Okay, so this is actually gonna be vulnerable for you. And um, and uh, just give it to you here because this is kind of embarrassing. And it's it's sad because even when I recorded this first one, like I know better than this. Um, but it just goes to show, like, I was just kind of doing paid, paid traffic for the very first time. I was very uncertain. And the uncertainty was the root cause of this kind of shitty energy and tonality. Okay? So I'm actually going to have to pause this video and then change the audio because I'm walking through a headset. One sec. Okay, so we're going to get into this now. What up, guys? Cole here. And if you're on this page, I should just put the console with me and my team in the next few days. So in the meantime, I wanted to give you some concrete next steps so you know how to show up as prepared as possible to get as much value as possible out of our time together. So um, real quick, just add it. Okay, so we only need to even go through 15 seconds to see how bad this is. Now, um, look at like the level of apprehension. I'm almost like, like almost leaning away from um, the camera. My eyebrows are lifted. I'm kind of like overly critical about like overthinking what I'm saying a lot. I'm not fully, like am I talking even how I'm talking now? To you guys, no. Like I'm almost just kind of like, just I have that can't contain expression. It's not full range. It's a little bit appreh apprehensive. It's not terrible in the sense of very very monotone, bad cadence, and you know upward inflecting and just very uncertain. But it's definitely not good, and it's not me. Okay, and it's because like I had never you know, and this is like a thank you page video for a paid traffic page. So it's like really not a big deal at all. But um, I was just in a place where it was like the first paid traffic video that I was created our pay traffic campaign that I was creating and I was just overthinking stuff. Okay. And it was coming across in my tonality and my certainty. Now compare and contrast this, this one. What's up guys. Cole here. And if you're on this page, you just booked a free sales team out with either me or my team. Okay. So there's going to be a quick, like 30, 60 second video here just to make sure you can show up as prepared as possible to get as much value as possible out of our call together. So first thing first in the email, you're going to get a Okay, so even look at my face. I mean, it's just not even a comparison. Like, I look like I'm a fucking killer <laughs> in this one, and then I look like I'm a total bitch in this one. Like, who do you want to buy from? Like, people buy from, like, ugh, like they buy from a little bit of grit opposed to, um, you know, whatever the hell this is, okay? So again, you know, like, go through this real fast. What up, guys? Cole here, and if you're on this page, I should... This is terrible. What's up, guys? Cole here. And if you're on this page, you just booked a free... So you see how I'm rolling downhill with my tonality in this one? It's on, you know, it's very downward inflecting. It's, hey, if you're on this page, like, it, listen up, you know? It's, I've told this, we've done this with a thousand people. A thousand people have been through this process. I know exactly what the next steps need to be so that you don't waste time. I don't waste time. Let's get into it, right? I'm not saying that explicitly, but that is my tonality and where I'm coming across, okay? And it's just so funny, like you can even see it Sales team. in my model with either me or in my face, like how much I'm even leaning into the camera. And um, it's just, you can see it in the level of certainty, okay? So hopefully, sometimes it's hard to put it in the words, but I recorded this video, um, you can see 9, 15, 20, so it's not even that long ago. And um, I was replacing the old video and I looked at the old video and it was at the same time I was kind of trying to teach some of this tonality stuff to one of our sales reps. And I was like, dude, you gotta, you gotta see this difference because this is exactly what you're doing wrong on the calls. And I'll tell you this guys, 
um, there's a lot of uh, buzz about neutral based language. Okay, trust based language. I'm a total proponent of that stuff. Now, at the same time, using trust based language, neutral based language doesn't mean you become a little bitch. All right. And that you have zero confidence ever. And you're like, okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I mean, at, at this point, um, where, where do you want to go from here? Like, you're not going to say that, guys. So there needs to be that level of directness and certainty. Okay. Um, and you can just see the difference. Like, it's just not even a, not even a question. Um, I mean, just look, it's just two different animals here. So um, that is going to be it for the video portion of this training. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm actually having my assistant splice them now so we remove any personal information, but there's two call reviews I recently did with two different sales teams where the sales reps both had basically the same problem. They both had very upward inflecting tonality, um, a locked in, uh, very capped range of expression. And because of the tonality and how, how poor it was, um, for lack of a better word, um, there was just no way, no matter what they said, it was not likely to be accepted to be true by the prospect, okay? And that trust and that authority was never going to be built, you know? And so that's why you can say the same words as somebody else is saying. You can use the same exact script and get two entirely different results. Because remember, going back up here, there's these three filters, and that's what our brain uses subconsciously because we want to conserve as much energy as possible how to accept what ideas to be true versus what ideas not to be true, okay? And it's all the way how you're communicating it and your subcommunication, not with the words that you're saying. So, Cole Gordon, that is uh, it for this training. I am uh, out.